Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. For, uh, thank you for joining us today. We're very glad that you are here for this session on um, living with food allergies. Uh, my name is Julie Hilton. Um, I will be your host and MC today. And uh, and I'm a uh, director of marketing and communications at Medical Alert. And uh, we're so happy to have with us today um, some very esteemed speakers and our partners from the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection team. Here's what's gonna happen. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Medical Alert quickly, meet our speakers. Uh, we'll hear about fact. Um, then the majority of our time today is gonna be spent on Q and A with, uh, with our speakers. We got a lot of great questions. So we're gonna try to cover as many of them as possible. And I apologize in advance for the ones we're not able to get to. Um, and then we'll end as we always do with some additional resources for you. So just very quickly, um, a little bit about Medical Alert for those of you that may not be familiar. Um, this particular subject today is so incredibly relevant for us because Medical Alert was founded because of an allergy. Um, in 1953, a girl named Linda Collins cut herself and went to the emergency room. Her parents weren't with her, but um, she was given a, a tetanus antitoxin and had an anaphylactic reaction to it and uh, was in a coma, almost died. Luckily, she pulled through, but when her parents came back in town, her father, Dr. Collins, was like, I need a way to let other people know that my daughter has a potential life-threatening condition because I can't always be there to protect her. So I need someone to help me or some way to help me do that. Um, in the beginning, he started creating little paper bracelets for her to wear. He'd pin a note to her shirt. But when she was going away to college, um, he knew that they needed a, a more permanent solution. And that's when he went to a jeweler in San Francisco and designed a medical art bracelet. Looks very much today, today like the, the one here. And uh, once she was away at college, Linda's friend saw this and said, you know, I have asthma or I have diabetes or I have some other condition that people need to know about. And Dr. Collins very quickly realized that this idea was bigger than just his daughter, that there was a lot of people that would benefit from um, having their needs and conditions communicated in an emergency. So uh, he and his wife founded uh, Medical Alert as a nonprofit foundation. Uh, we've been a nonprofit ever since. And one of the, you know, there's a lot of people that provide uh, medical IDs, but some of the things that make Medical Alert different are, um, in addition to what's engraved on your ID, we also keep um, a very detailed emergency health profile that, uh, that you as the member are able to provide the information that you want communicated in an emergency. And then our 24 seven emergency response team is always standing by to talk to a uh, first responder or a good Samaritan in case it's an emergency. So our mission, which really hasn't changed in the last 65 years is about saving and protecting lives by sharing vital information in our members moments of need. So it works just like I described. It starts out with your custom medical alert ID. Um, it's tied to your online health record in an emergency. First responders are trained to look for an ID and to contact Medical Alert's uh, emergency response team. And we're able to share with them all the information they need to provide fast and accurate care, as well as reach out to emergency contacts so that um, you're not alone in case of an emergency. So that's a little bit about Medical Alert. I am now going to introduce you to our very esteemed speakers for today. Um, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Shazad Mustafa. He's an allergist with the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Rochester Regional Health System. He serves as FACS Medical Advisory Board Chair. And after growing up in the Rochester area, he pursued his undergraduate studies at Johns Hopkins University and then attended medical school at SUNY Buffalo. He then completed his internal medicine training at the University of Colorado and stayed in Denver to complete his fellowship in allergy and clinical immunology at the University of Colorado National Jewish Health and Children's Hospital of Denver. While he was in Denver, Dr. Mustafa was involved in research on peanut allergy and new therapies for asthma. He's a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, which is a mouthful, and serves on several of their committees, including the Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee, as well as the Mast Cell Disorders Committee. 
He sees patients at the Rochester Regional Health System and is heavily involved in the allergy immunology training program at the University of Rochester School of Medicine, where he is a clinical assistant professor. He's also a parent to three children, one of whom has an allergy to peanuts and tree nuts. So he is, uh, he knows where, what we're talking about today from many different perspectives. So welcome, Dr. Mustafa. Thanks, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Next, I wanna introduce Eleanor uh, Garrow Holding. Eleanor has worked and educated, advocated in the food allergy community since 2004. She was inspired to start this work after her son was diagnosed with life-threatening food allergies to tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, and sesame, eosinophilic esophagitis, asthma, and environmental allergies. As the CEO of FACT, the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection Team, Eleanor provides leadership development and implementation for all of FACT's initiatives and programs, including the very cool Camp Tag, uh, also known as the Allergy Gang, which is a summer camp for children with food allergies and their siblings that she founded in 2009. She has a Bachelor of Healthcare Administration from Lewis University and worked in hospital management for 16 years prior to coming to the nonprofit sector. In addition to her work with FACT, she works with food industry companies like McDonald's and entertainment venues like SeaWorld to educate their employees about food allergies. So Eleanor, we're so delighted to have you today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So I wanted to introduce, since we just talked about Eleanor and FACT, Eleanor, if you wanna talk a little bit about FACT's mission. Sure, so our mission is up on the screen here to educate, advocate, and raise awareness for all individuals affected by food allergies and life-threatening anaphylaxis. Uh, we really focus on education, advocacy, and awareness within schools, colleges, universities, restaurants, daycare centers, uh, things of that nature, and also really focus on school accommodations, programming throughout the year, whether it's with campers and teen counselors or our teen retreat, our food industry and research summit, as well as working closely with our support group leaders from across the country, as we have over 200 support groups. And it's really just providing that day-to-day -day support for our families and individuals, adults with food allergies, and really keeping everyone connected year round with the education, advocacy, and awareness. Great. Thank you for that. And I know today we're going to try to point out a number of different resources that are available through FACT. Um, once you have a chance to dive into their website, which is at foodallergyawareness.org, you will find um, there is a tremendous amount of really valuable information there and really great downloads, printable things, uh, a lot of different tools and resources for you there. So without further ado, we're going to jump into the Q&A portion here and start with something very basic so we're all on the same page. What's a food allergy and what's the difference between food allergy and food intolerance? I can jump in with that, uh, Julie. So I think these words are super important to kind of like level set all of us, right? So there's a lot of reactions to foods, right? If I drink coffee, ca caffeine, I might get jittery. That's obviously not a food allergy. Or intolerances. I think people are familiar with lactose intolerance. So food allergy is an immune mediated reaction. So most food allergies are mediated by this antibody called IgE. I think people might be familiar with that. When you go to an allergist for skin testing, you're checking for IgE, or you can get allergy testing where you can kind of check a level of IgE. So food allergy is immune mediated um, and it, it, there's key differences and intolerance or a sensitivity is not immune mediated. So we don't understand the mechanism. Mm -hmm. Food allergy is often dose independent, a very little amount can be very dangerous, whereas an intolerance is often dose dependent. So think about it like a milk allergy or a lactose intolerance. For people who are milk allergic, they're reading labels. They can't even have a little distal of milk. Lactose intolerance, you might be able to have a little bit, but not a lot, right? Um, an allergy puts you at risk for anaphylaxis. So anyone with a true allergy should be carrying epinephrine, reading labels. Intolerances and sensitivities, although unpleasant, could never lead to life-threatening anaphylaxis. That's just not a concern. You don't need to carry epinephrine. The history is different. Kids often outgrow food allergies. I know we'll touch upon that. So allergies, we know kind of when they come on, the likelihood of outgrowing over time. Intolerances are a little more hit or miss. Um, you know, they can kind of come and go change over time. So there's a lot of key differences. 
And if you think you have, you know, a problem with a food in certain foods, it's very important to iron out what the exact diagnosis is. Is it an allergy? Is it intolerance for wheat? Is it, you know, or gluten celiac disease, right? That's a different thing. Um, so these words really do matter. I think. Great. Thank you for that. Building on that a little bit, what are the typical symptoms of a food allergy? Uh, and then do different allergens cause different effects? Or do they all sort of look alike? Yeah. Um, Eleanor, I can jump in here. Or, you know, jump no, in you take time. all the medical <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, so the vast majority of allergic reactions to foods um, have similarities. The vast majority in the outpatient setting will have a rash, um, an immediate rash, usually hives and HD rash. 90% of allergic reactions to foods happen within 20 minutes. 99% happen within two hours. So if you have it, you know, if you develop hives at seven o'clock at night, I really don't care what you had for breakfast or lunch that day. It's really a 20 minute window to two hours. So common symptoms, certainly itchy rash is by far and away the most common, probably present in 80 and 90% of reactions. Other common symptoms, swelling, lip swelling, eye swelling, facial swelling, difficulty breathing, wheezing, Coughing, these are all common reactions. Abdominal symptoms, nausea, vomiting can be possible. Um, and then if you get into the really serious reactions where you're having changes with blood pressure, you know, lightheadedness, passing out, now that's getting into not just an allergic reaction, but anaphylactic shock, uh, which is a very severe reaction. So these are the common symptoms. I think the timing is very important. And most allergic reactions, regardless of the specific allergen, uh, will have a similar presentation. You know, there are some subtle differences, but again, that's the general spiel, I think. Great, thank you. That's clear. And I think we touched on this a little bit, but does the quantity of an allergen you ingest affect the severity of the reaction? And I think you just said no. In a, yeah, a generally not. Obviously, if you have a lot of allergen, your reaction may be more severe. You may absorb more of it in your GI tract over time. But generally, we think of a little bit can be just as dangerous as a lot. And that's a unique aspect of food allergy, which makes it hard to manage, right? Individuals with food allergies have to be reading labels and avoiding a little bit. I think it's a nice opportunity to chime in here. For most food allergens, you really do have to ingest the food to have a reaction. Okay. Um, being around it is generally safe. Skin contact may lead to a little bit of itchy rash at the site of the contact, but it shouldn't spread the systemic reaction or anaphylaxis. Airborne reactions, especially to peanut, are uncommon, highly uncommon. Interesting. Um, so that's a common misconception. Mm -hmm. um, actually, allergy to seafood has more likely to cause airborne symptoms than peanut, for example. Oh, interesting. I think these are important points that there's a lot of you know, confusion about misinformation. So the quantity generally doesn't matter. And then the exposure absolutely matters. Ingestion is the trouble spot. You know, being around it, skin, airborne, generally much less risky. So the quantity would really not apply for an allergy, but in the case of the intolerance that we were talking about earlier, it would make a difference. Yeah. A, a significant percentage of the population has some degree of lactose intolerance, right? And those individuals can often, they don't have to read labels, right. or maybe they can have processed foods with milk, but they can't have a milkshake or ice cream Sunday, anything that. Right. So, you know, a little bit is okay, but a lot's not, not. An allergy is different. Even a little bit can lead to a life-threatening reaction. So we're going to talk about that life-threatening reaction now, um, anaphylaxis. Uh, what triggers it and what happens in your body? Yeah, so there's different triggers for anaphylaxis uh, in, uh, in children. Food allergies are common. Um, and the common food allergies I think are important. Milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, soy, seafood, and seeds. Those are kind of the most common food allergens, uh, food allergens um, in ch children particularly. Uh, other triggers for anaphylaxis in adults, particularly stinging insects, bees, can right. cause anaphylaxis. I think we know that. Medications can cause anaphylaxis. That's actually one of the most common causes in a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so these things are all triggers of anaphylaxis. Importantly, I don't think environmental allergies, so many people have environmental allergies. You get stuffy, runny, sneezy, itchy eyes. Rarely do they cause anaphylaxis. Um, and then the symptoms we kind of touched upon. Anytime you have kind of generalized symptoms, hives all over, or certainly any symptoms beyond the skin, trouble breathing, wheezing, coughing, passing out, that is anaphylaxis. And if anyone takes away anything from today, the treatment for anaphylaxis is not 
and antihistamine. It's not Benadryl or diphenhydramine. The treatment for anaphylaxis is epinephrine, intramuscular epinephrine. Many of us know it as EpiPen. There are several other devices actually on the market. The medicine is epinephrine and it, it works really, really quickly and it works well for anaphylaxis where antihistamines really aren't designed to treat anaphylaxis and they don't do a great job of it. Great. Um, we had a lot of questions around this. Are food allergies correlated to other medical conditions? And is, what's the relationship with other autoimmune disorders? That's a great question. So unfortunately, allergic conditions have increased in the United States. Um, and it's kind of a set of five right now. Um, kids often get eczema. That's one of the first allergic conditions they get. And that tends to get better with age. Then they usually develop food allergies if they're going to have these allergic conditions. And some many food allergies go away with age. Some don't. We can talk about that. Asthma is part of this. One of the last things that happen is environmental allergies or allergic rhinitis, that's step four. And then the kind of newer one that we, we're seeing more and more of in this allergic constellation of symptoms is eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, Eleanor mentioned it in the setting of her son. It's an inflammatory condition of the esophagus that kind of makes it difficult to swallow food, you choke, you gag. Um, so that's kind of the set of five. So food allergies are often co go in line with these other conditions. Um, there's not a huge relationship between food allergies and uh, allergic conditions and autoimmune conditions. I think they're kind of overly simplistically different arms of the immune system. But that set of five, we often see in many of our individuals. My son has a peanut uh, allergy, cashew pistachio. He also has atopic dermatitis. He also has allergic rhinitis, uh, seasonal allergies. So these things really do go in clusters. Interesting. Um... We talked to, touched on this earlier, you would talk a little bit more. It's like, can you outgrow and conversely, can you develop new food allergies even as an adult? Yeah, I think this is a really important point. And this is why I think anyone who thinks they have a true food allergy would likely benefit from an evaluation from an allergist. Um, certainly primary care physicians, pediatricians can manage a lot, but to truly figure out when you've outgrown a food allergy, um, it, it usually does require an allergist. So food allergies can be outgrown. 95% um, of kids outgrow egg allergy. Um, you know, as they get older, uh, 80 to 95 percent of the kids outgrow milk allergy. Wheat and soy allergy are almost outgrown in childhood, almost always. Peanut and tree nut allergy can be outgrown as well, but much less common. Only about 15 to 20 percent of individuals outgrow that, but it still happens. So it deserves reevaluation. Um, so many food allergies are outgrown. The ones that tend to stick around are peanuts, tree nuts, seafood, and maybe seeds. Um, conversely, in adulthood, you know, it's extraordinarily uncommon for an adult to develop a new milk allergy, not intolerance, but allergy or an egg allergy or a soy allergy. But adults can develop food allergies. And they tend to be the ones that I mentioned that they last into adulthood. Peanuts, tree nuts, seafood, that's what you see most commonly in adults. So very important, the age of when the reaction occurs and what you think the food may be causing the reaction. Age is super important with evaluation. We're going to talk about that a little bit when we talk about diagnosis. Um, but one other question that came up quite frequently is there's been a lot that's happened in the last, I don't know, so, so ever, ever so many years on peanut allergies and new thinking and research around that. I know that's one of your areas of focus. You want to talk to us a little bit about that? So yeah, this question could last the whole hour. So I'm going to try <laughs> to hit the high points. Um, I think the best part about allergies is preventing them, not treating them, right? So I think the science right now speaks really well. There was a huge study that, you know, a lot of people are familiar with published in February of 2015 that really proved what we had started to think was the right way. And it proved that early introduction of peanuts, especially in individuals who are at high risk of developing peanut allergy, decreases their risk of developing peanut allergy. Mm -hmm. And by early introduction in kids, we meant between kind of four to 11 months of age. Right. So there is no reason to delay introducing peanut products or other highly allergenic foods to kids. In fact, earlier is probably better. What we were surprised by in that study is in this high-risk group, these were kids with egg allergy or eczema, not only did early introduction decrease the likelihood of developing peanut allergy, it decreased it by more than 80%. Oh, wow. A huge number. So certainly the guidelines right now say there is no reason to delay the introduction of foods in kids when they start eating at four to six months, seven, eight months, whenever they're, whenever they're ready, all foods are a go. So that's prevention. Treatment as of right now is still avoidance and carrying epinephrine. But finally, as of last year, we have our first ever FDA approved treatment for peanut allergy. It is an FDA approved oral immunotherapy. So it's a daily peanut powder. 
And it's the concept of like allergy shots. If anyone's had allergy shots, you introduce this at a very low dose and then increase it over time. There's important points here. It doesn't cure your allergy. It doesn't let individuals with peanut allergy consume peanuts, but it protects them from a reaction in case of accidental exposure. Does it so, desensitize you? Yeah. So it's desensitizing. It's a desensitizing, but not making unallergic. There's a subtle mm -hmm. difference. And you have to stay on this therapy indefinitely on a daily basis. So it's a big commitment, but it's yeah. got, you know, significant bang for your buck. It's kind of like a seatbelt. It decreases your risk of reacting if you come across peanuts. And that, of course, it happens in life, right? right. People have accidental exposures. Um, so this was FDA approved early last year. This is the first FDA approved therapy, and there will certainly be more coming on down the pike for not just peanut allergy, but other foods as well. That's exciting. Um, my grandfather was a peanut farmer. Peanut farmers go way back in my family. So uh, we're happy anything that makes peanuts more available and less, uh, less frightening for people that have allergies. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. Uh, what's involved in the testing? What are the most reliable testing for uh, food allergies? Yeah, super important. Eleanor knows this is a big part of what we do to get the diagnosis right. Unfortunately, food allergy is overdiagnosed in the United States by physician, but physicians by a lot, and certainly self-reported overdiagnosis is quite significant. The most important thing is taking a history, like we talked about, Julie. What is the food you're worried about? What was the reaction? How quickly did it happen after the food? You know, I joke, but it's harder to convince me that you're allergic to cucumbers or broccoli than compared to peanuts or milk or eggs. So the food matters, the timing of the reaction, the, child, the individual's age at the time of the reaction. And the allergists often we often do skin testing, which is a great test to start the process. It's not a per perfect test. It's not a pregnancy test, I say. It's not a yes, no, it needs to be interpreted. A negative test makes it very unlikely that you're allergic to a food. A positive test only says with certain degree of certainty that you might be allergic to a food. And that could be as low as 50%. So again, you have to interpret it in light of um, the history. Then we can do blood work too. The skin test is a qualitative yes, no. Do you have the antibodies? I mentioned IgE, the specific IgE blood work. Some people call it RAST or immunocap. That quantifies the level of IgE, again, from zero to over 100. And just like the skin test, it's not a yes, no test. It has to be interpreted with caution because if you, the tests do have, you know, there's a lot of people with antibodies on skin testing and blood work who are not allergic. So you never want to be testing broadly. You really want to test for specific foods depending on the individual is uh, telling you. We're discouraged from doing food panels. Like you shouldn't check someone for 30, 40, 50 foods because you're going to invariably get, you know, for lack of a better term, false positives in a way. Um, so the testing is taking a good history, maybe skin testing, maybe blood work and getting a diagnosis. And sometimes we still don't know. So in the allergist hand, we do what we call an oral food challenge. We actually expose you to the food if we don't know mm -hmm. uh, in a controlled, safe way. And we do these a lot in food, uh, people who manage food allergy. In our practice, we do about 15 a week. Oh, wow. um, we really have to do a lot of food challenges at this point. There's being more research going into better tests where we may not have to do food challenges. But right now, we do a lot of those. And I think just as importantly, Julie, there's a lot of tests out there that are not great tests for food allergies that are really available and people stumble mm -hmm. upon them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. IgG testing, which you can do via the mail and certain doctors is not very helpful and maybe, you know, actually be a little bit um, misleading with results. Um, there's all sorts of hair analysis, this and that. I would discourage individuals from seeking those. If you have concerns of food allergies, start with your doctor, start with your provider, primary care doctor, pediatrician, certainly seek out an allergist. There is good mm -hmm. testing and we can certainly figure out what foods you are or are not allergic. Is there a typical age when someone is diagnosed? It depends on the food. Um, so, you know, depending on what age and that's different foods. So kids have food allergies much more than adults. I would never expect an adult to develop a new milk or egg or wheat or soy allergy, maybe an intolerance mm -hmm. or sensitivity, but not an allergy. Right. Um, so absolutely, it depends on the food what you're talking about, depending on what age of diagnosis. Yeah, I, I'm reading uh, with Eleanor, I think your son was under two, I believe, when he was diagnosed. Yeah, so the vast majority of kids yeah. diagnosed with food allergy are before age one, actually. Oh, really? Um, okay. My son was diagnosed, I think, um, I want to say a little, a little over a year. Um, but yeah, most children are diagnosed before age one. Um, so, you know, this is much more of a pediatric thing than an adult thing, generally. 
And what would lead you to seek out that diagnosis if there's some evidence of those symptoms that we talked about earlier that you can't seem to... Yeah, so any other... food allergies don't... Yeah, they don't really cause chronic symptoms. Chronic eczema or chronic hives is rarely a food allergy. It's a little bit stereotypic. I was exposed to food or my son or child was exposed to food and this happened within 20 minutes or two hours. Uh, you know, in training, I trained in Denver. Uh, one of my mentors said that, you know, physicians don't diagnose food allergies, families do. Uh, they tell you, I gave, you know, so-and-so this food, he had a reaction. I wasn't sure what happened. I gave it again, happened again, here I am. Uh, but, you know, there's so much counseling, Eleanor touches upon that, and so support around it. Mm -hmm. And if you're allergic to one food, if you're allergic to peanuts, can you eat tree nuts? Right. You know, there's so much counseling and other stuff around it that I do think it's important to seek good care. If you're allergic to food, yeah, you can just avoid it, but there's a lot of nuance to the discussion. And, you know, maximizing quality of life, even if from setting a food allergy, is so important to me. Um, and I think an allergist and your provider can help with that. Great. And we talked a little bit about the peanut treatment, but other than that, are there really any treatments or cures for food allergies out there? As of right now, um, there are uh, no known cures for food allergies. I mean, the good thing is many kids do outgrow food allergy over time. Um, so again, if there's no cures and our treatments are pretty rudimentary, let's try to prevent these, right? So early, early introduction to highly allergenic foods, I think is a huge point. And you know, that we've changed, uh, the, the science has changed over the last 10, 15 years. Great. Talk a little bit, Miss. Go to the next slide. So we talked about anaphylaxis and, you know, understanding that, um, I guess, the, the responsibility of anybody that has food allergy or their caregivers to be very vigilant and avoid those things as much as possible, but there's always the potential that you could come into contact with that allergen. So how do you prepare for that anaphylactic emergency? And uh, when do you use that um, epine epine right? epinephrine yeah. auto predictor? And uh, we specifically had one person say, you know, if, I, if I'm within 20 minutes of a hospital, do I still need to do this or should I wait to get to the hospital? Yeah. Um, so I think anyone with a true food allergy, not an intolerance, but if you have a true food allergy, you should have an, a prescription for an epinephrine auto injector, and ideally two, because some reactions require more, more than one dose. So that's ideal. You, you should carry this at all times. Again, antihistamines are not your treatment of choice. Treating an, an, an anaphylaxis is with epinephrine. So carrying it, having it available, so many people have prescriptions and, you know, they're sitting at home or in a cupboard, they're, they're less helpful there. So carry it, carry it, carry it. You have an allergic reaction. If it's local symptoms, you know, if you ate something, you have a little itchy mouth or itchy lips, I think an antihistamine is okay. That's not anaphylaxis. But if it's systemic, if it's spread, you have hives all over, or certainly if you have any symptoms beyond the skin, you're having trouble breathing, things like that, epinephrine is a treatment of choice. And I would say if you're hemming and hawing, if you're worried about should I be using epi or not, use it. Epinephrine injections, epinephrine intramuscularly has very little side effects and has, it works really, really well. So the benefit is great, the downside is very low. If you use epinephrine and you didn't really need it, no harm done, it's a shot of adrenaline. It just gives you a little bit of juice, it's not really harmful. If you need epinephrine and you don't use it or you delay it, that's when you get into risks of bad outcomes. If you're right. under reaction. So I certainly would encourage everyone with a food allergy or risk of anaphylaxis, bee sting allergy to carry epinephrine, ideally to have them available and use them early if you think there's any symptoms you know, beyond site of exposure. So in the context of a bee sting, if you're stung on your hand and have some redness of your hand, maybe antihistamines are okay, but if you're covered in hives and having trouble breathing or, you know, covered in hives and your lip is swelling, epinephrine is the way to go. So always better to treat uh, than not treat. Absolutely, and Eleanor can probably chime in here too. This is a huge part of the advocacy work she does. It's such an important thing. Things it like is because we get so many parents that will ask us that question where they start questioning themselves. Should I, shouldn't I? Because when you're in that moment, you as a parent, you're not in your right frame of mind either because you become very anxious and scared. Yeah. And we always instill in everyone, when in doubt, give Epi and never ever leave home without it. And as this screen shows as well, have your anaphylaxis emergency plan signed off by your board certified allergist. So if you're not with your child or someone else is caring for your child at the time, if 
a reaction does occur, then they can refer to that action plan with your child's medication. So with, with my son, I mean, he's had an act, uh, emergency plan since he was 19 months old and he carries it with his auto injectors all the time and never leaves home without it and has become a wonderful advocate for himself like so many of our children do as they grow up into teens and young adults into adulthood. Yeah. I think it's an important point here to facilitate that, Julie. Mm -hmm. There are different types of epinephrine auto injectors. Oh, okay. um, you know, we're very familiar with EpiPen. It's almost like Kleenex, right? But right. there are different brands and the devices are different shapes. In fact, there's some devices that look like a little bit of a cell phone. So again, speak to your provider, speak to your physicians, your allergists, your pediatrician, your primary care about what are the choices? What are the devices? How much do they cost? I mean, cost is a real world concerns. Some are less expensive than others. Um, so we really do work with trying to make it easiest for the families. And right. The also on our website, if you go to our anaphylaxis page or our epinephrine page, we have a downloadable poster of all the epinephrine auto injectors that are on the market. As of now, we update it all the time if something new changes or comes to the market. And it has all of the information needed for each of those auto injectors, including saving plans, coupons, how to use, how to administer, and links you to those videos to watch how to administer that auto injector. And that's a downloadable poster on our website. Great. And uh, just a couple notes here. One is that we're recording this session. So if you want to come back and listen to a certain part or see more about this, um, you can come back and do that. And uh, two, in the chat, Deanna uh, on my team is popping some of these links in here to, for instance, the um, anaphylaxis emergency plan that we just talked about. And then three, um, everyone that registered for the event will have a follow-up email uh, tomorrow that will include some of these critical links for you too. So we'll try to make as many of these resources available. But the last four, the point four I will add there is, um, again, I think part of your uh, preparation for a potential anaphylactic emergency is something like medical art. You know, that's something that can be a really effective tool, especially if you know, you're in a situation where you can't speak for yourself, for somebody to be able to know very quickly that you have an allergy and you're carrying epinephrine and to treat you with that can truly be life-saving. And we've used Medic Alert since Thomas was 19 months old and he's now 18. So we've uh, gotten many products from you guys over the years and, it, and it's wonderful. So thank you for all that you do. We, uh, we, were, we had a story from another uh, patient who has uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. Did I get it right? Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, they wait until their kid is asleep. When he starts to outgrow his bracelet, they wait until he's asleep and then they go in and change out the new one so that he doesn't, he, like in his mind, he never takes it off. So they just keep changing it out in a larger size for him, which I find really adorable as parents. But um, anyway, the idea that, you know, he didn't ever really want to be without it. So. Um, all right, uh, we talked about this earlier, but you know, will taking antihistamines either reduce my food allergy or prevent anaphylaxis? I think we have a, we have a no on the prevent anaphylaxis. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the simple answer is no. Would it change the nature of your reaction? Maybe modestly, but it's not gonna pre prevent anaphylaxis. Like there is no amount of antihistamines I can give my son before I <laughs> give him peanut. It's not gonna work. So I think antihistamines are great drugs for local rashes, little itching here and there for environmental allergies sometimes. But beyond that, they're not designed to do much and they don't do much of anything. Got it. Thank you for clarifying. I think that helps a lot of people. Uh, let's see. Um, can you talk a little bit about immunotherapy uh, options? We had several questions about this. Um, some of, I guess, some newer treatments that have come out that people are like, hmm, does this work? Is it safe? Yeah, so this is, I think, very important. So immunotherapy is like, you know, the process of desensitization, Julie, you mentioned that earlier. I think maybe several of our viewers, people on the call have, are familiar with immunotherapy in the setting of allergy shots for environmental allergens. That's immunotherapy. So sequentially increasing uh, the dose of an allergen over time to desensitize someone. In the world of food allergy, there's kind of three forms. There's oral immunotherapy, which again, for peanut is now FDA approved for individuals between four and 17 years of age. The brand name is Palforzia. 
So, you know, if you have a peanut allergy, you're an individual, you have a child between age four and 17, they are a candidate for that. So, you know, certainly speak to your allergist about that. And then there's being, there's other forms that are being studied. Sublingual immunotherapy is again, taking peanut protein, but not in a powder form that you swallow. It's under the tongue, sublingual. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of work for epicutaneous immunotherapy. So this is a peanut patch or a little patch the size of a quarter transduces peanut protein across the skin. I mean, it's fascinating science. Yeah. Um, split, the sublingual and the epicutaneous epit um, is still in research phase and not commercially available. I will say there are some allergists in the United States, depending on where you are, prescribing split for peanut and other foods. It's off label, it's not FDA approved, but you know, certainly an option depending on where you live with your local allergist. Mm -hmm. uh, but the only FDA approved product right now is a peanut oral immunotherapy. It came out last year. Um, the biggest difference here is the dose that you're exposed to and the degree of protection you get. Oral immunotherapy is the highest dose. It gives you the biggest degree of protection, but every yang has a yang, right? So more protection, there are more side effects. Right. Um, slit is a lower dose, lower degree of protection, but better tolerated, less side effects. And epicutaneous attaches the lowest dose, very few side effects, mm -hmm. but actually the least protection offered. Mm -hmm. The fascinating time in this world with lots of research going on. Yeah. All right, so uh, this this made me it just broke my heart when I read this. Is yeah. my child was just diagnosed, and I am completely overwhelmed. Where do I start? What are the most important things that I need to know? And the most important thing to know is your child's going to be okay. Um, I've been there. It's absolutely overwhelming at first. Um, I don't even you know. This is an annoying little trait of mine. I never say. Uh, individuals with food allergy are my patients. They're individuals with food allergy. Food allergy is not a disease. It's a condition. It's a big deal. I live with it at home, but individuals with food allergies should live very normal lives. Um, you have to take precaution. You have to take extra steps. So I think that's the most important point. You have lots of questions, so you need to connect with people who have good answers. Um, it's 2021. I think we all appreciate this age of information that we're surrounded in, which is great, which is dangerous as well. There's a lot of misinformation. Right. Speak to your allergist and your primary care physician about your questions. If they don't have the answers, they should see, uh, point you in directions where you can get answers. Seek out uh, things like FACT and all these resources. Seek out support groups for people in your boat. But I think the important thing is that people will do well. There are a lot of questions. The science is fantastic. We have a lot of great answers based on science. Mm -hmm. And just careful of what you hear. There's a lot of misinformation in general, but particularly in the world of food allergy. And I don't want it to be misleading for families. So again, I said, diagnosis is easy. It's usually made by the time people come to me. Right. The counseling and the answering of the questions are really what I think is so important. I think groups like Eleanor's are invaluable at that. And I think, you know, Eleanor, you can talk a little bit to some of these resources, but the value here is that you've developed these and then you've vetted them through people like Dr. Mustafa and the rest of the people on your medical advisory team to make sure that that information is valid and correct and, you know, that they can, is free of some of the misinformation that's out there. Yes, all of our content on our website, all of our resources, everything is reviewed and approved by our medical advisory board. Uh, they are the ones who give us our credibility and we would never put anything out there that's not evidence-based or factual. And as a, as a parent, I would just like to say as a takeaway for those who are newly diagnosed, it's really important to know that you are not alone. I know that when I um, had that diagnosis with Thomas. We were at a family birthday party. We have no family history of food allergies at all in our family. And it was surprising thinking, how is this happening to him? And so I felt very alone in that first week or two until we got the testing and diagnosis for him. But then I, I very quickly found that support and the education and the resources. And we're from the Chicago area and I served at a support group in the suburb I lived in because there wasn't one and really got involved with the education, advocacy and awareness and uh, really 
within the state of Illinois. And then obviously I went to the national level and um, really I think finding a support group in your area, which you can find one on our website as well and our support group development page, uh, find a support group near you, just enter in your zip code or your state. And just knowing it's so important to know that you are not alone and there's always, um, you know, we always want everyone to have hope as well. Thomas has outgrown many of his food allergies. As Dr. Mustafa was mentioning earlier, he has outgrown peanut, milk, wheat, um, sesame, and almond. So now we're just avoiding all of the other tree nuts. He's also in remission for his eosinophilic esophagitis uh, for the past four years now. We're hoping it stays that way. <laughs> um, but there, there's always hope as well. And, and as he got older, it was more um, about 12, 13 to 14 years old is when he started outgrowing his allergies. And of course, as Dr. Mustafa knows, the only way to know if you've outgrown a food allergy is if your levels are low on a blood test, and then you have to do an oral food challenge in a clinical setting to make sure you've truly outgrown that food allergy. So yeah, important, you're not alone. And there's probably not a question you have that hasn't been asked and answered somewhere else. So seek out those resources that can help you uh, start to muddle through. Um, because it is a big, I mean, I'm sure as a parent, it's very frightening to think, oh, right, there's things out there that potentially could kill my child if I don't keep them safe. Um, so, you know, knowing that there are ways to do that and uh, other people, other people make it through and you can live very normally is, is very encouraging to a lot of people. Yes, and the screen that you had up with our newly diagnosed guide, that is free and downloadable on our website, but it's really everything in that guide is what you need to know right now mm -hmm. uh, when you're newly diagnosed because it is overwhelming and there's so much to learn and educate yourself on, but definitely start with that and our caregiver's guide as well, which is for parents, grandparents, whoever might be caring for your child. Right. Um, I think one of those things you have to get educated about this, I love this person's like reading labels is so hard. What's a good resource out there for deciphering food additives, chemical names, like, you know, how do I, how do I know what to look for? So I think it's important about what are the allergens, right? So we talked about the common allergens. There's a lot of additives and chemical names that may have a sensitivity, mm -hmm. you know, may not sit well with you, but they're more, they're much less likely to be an allergen to elicit an immune response to cause a food allergy. Most individuals who are soy allergic, which are generally younger kids, can tolerate soy lecithin, which is in a lot of stuff. These little subtle points are super important to maintaining quality of life and making things easier. Julie, you mentioned muddled through, right? Mm -hmm. I think we can do better than muddled. Yeah. Um, but yeah. these are the little details. So um, reading labels or cow's milk isn't always labeled cow's milk, you know, casein or whey or what have you. So again, go back. There's great resources at FACT and other places about how to read labels, you know, sneaking things in where you wouldn't expect it, you know, eggs and, you know, ranch dressing or what have you. So I think it's important what the foods are, the top, you know, these common food allergens are required to be labeled. Sesame was just added to that list, which is great. We have sesame seed allergens are more common seed allergens now. Right. But I want to reassure people, additives and chemicals, you know, things like that are less likely to be a food allergen, but, you know, there may be a little more leeway there than the common food allergy. And on our website under food allergy and anaphylaxis, the tab at the top, mm -hmm. we have a section on all of the top eight allergens by allergen, including all the different names that you can find for that allergen. As uh, Dr. Mustafa was saying for milk, the whey, casein, lactose, there's a lot of different names. So that's on our website as well. And also in that section is a section on food labeling and everything that you need to know regarding the um, FALCPA, the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act regarding the top allergens as well. And I believe I saw a place on your site where you post um, if there's been any announcements or recalls or uh, label changes that yes. people can access pretty easily. Yes, at the top of our website, there's a, a tab for alerts mm -hmm. and recalls and you can subscribe for those alerts. And so every time there's a recall or an alert through the FDA or the USDA 
or a food manufacturing company that contacts us directly regarding an issue with their product, then we will post that on our website, as well as email it to those who are subscribed to receive those alerts from us. Got it. Great. Another very common question, how do you deal with food allergies when you're dining out or at, at someone else's house? You know, everything's not in your control in these cases. Yeah, there has to be some element of trust. I mean, the bad part is food allergies have increased in the United States in the last 10 or 20 years, but the good part is food allergies have increased. So, you know, you're not a unicorn if you go to a restaurant or a friend's house. Heck, when we had friends, over, well, we haven't had friends over that much lately with COVID, but when we used to, you know, we'd almost ask at this point, does anyone have a food allergy, right? It's, it's almost become, unfortunately, so common. So with my son too, we, you know, going out to restaurants, I think is absolutely appropriate. Again, you have to take steps. You have to tell the, the staff that my son had, you know, your child, your, you have a food allergy, you have to have epinephrine with you. Uh, but restaurants are, most of them are very, pretty well versed at doing this. Um, and they'll tell you, you know, you'll get a sense if they're not comfortable. So again, tell them you're food allergic, have to have epinephrine, um, you know, talk about, you know, ask any questions you may have, but I think it is very manageable while you take some, you know, extra steps with caution. And I, I agree with everything that you just said. I know we've always dined out uh, with Thomas and we travel as well, domestic and international. And we've just made sure that everyone is very educated and aware. And when we're going to restaurants, we make sure from front of the house to the back of the house that are aware and educated on food allergy management. If they're not, then we have left restaurants before in the past if we don't feel safe or we don't have that trust. Uh, same with going to someone's home or if they're coming into our home, I always ask to, does anyone have food allergies or restrictions or intolerances? Because I always wanna make sure that everyone feels safe and included and we're providing anything you know that will be safe for them too. And usually when we have people in our home, which as Dr. Mustafa said, we haven't had anyone in our home for over a year and a half. Um, but when we do, uh, I usually always prepare the food and never have anyone bring anything because then I know everything is completely safe uh, for everyone in our home. But it's, it's really about the education and making sure they're aware. And they've come a long way over the years since 17 years ago when we first started dining out okay. with Thomas. So it's, it's come a long way with the education over the years. There's still more to do of course as always, but usually we, we always have safe experiences. Well, the next question is actually related to education. So how do I prepare my kid, my kid for school? And then how do I make sure school is safe for my kid? Yeah, so I think this question is pretty nuanced. It depends on how old your kid is. Um, you know, daycare from elementary school to high school is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. I think in general, the process stays the same. Um, everyone at school, staff, teachers, child, depending on age, needs to know that they have whatever food allergy. Epinephrine must be available. Children with food allergies must have epinephrine and an emergency action plan at school. Again, it's a little bit like restaurants over the last 10 or 20 years, schools have come a long way. Unfortunately, the average classroom has about two food allergic individuals in it. Um, so, you know, it's, people have become more and more knowledgeable on this. Um, so again, everyone needs to know epinephrine available emergency action plan, um, and then, you know, take it from there. Um, I'll be honest, I take care of a lot of families with food allergies and sometimes there's differences between them and their desires for risk mitigation at school and the school personnel, what they feel they can do, what is appropriate. Right. And almost always my experience has been, it's been an opportunity for education, like Eleanor just said. Our teachers, our school administrators, they go to, they work because they love kids and love taking care of our kids. No one's wishing harm on anyone. So sometimes if someone is not providing an accommodation, this or that, I see it as a role, as an opportunity to educate. And say, wait, this is, you know, a really good thought. You know, I think this is how you can do it. Some other school has done it this way. Or, you know, maybe this isn't the best move. You know, there's other ways to do this. I think it's important. Again, FACT has resources on this. The CDC, for what it's worth, has huge, a big guideline on, you know, management of food allergy in school settings. This is very important. It's nerve wracking for individual parents as kids go head off to school. But, you know, I think the vast majority of children, individuals with food allergy at school do really, really well. 
Yes, and I was actually on the committee for the CDC guidelines uh, when those were created. And um, along with our other resources, we do have that on our website as well, but in our Education Resource Center, uh, that's where you will find all of our school resources broken down by sections, as well as our school programs that are up on the screen here are facts for schools. And then we're the only organization that has a food allergy curricula program for schools where the teachers educate the students in the classroom. And that's K through three, four through eight in high school and companion manuals, PowerPoints, games and activities, lesson plans, everything is free and downloadable on our website in the Education Resource Center. And regarding accommodations in schools, we've assisted over 5,000 families when it comes to accommodations in schools since we launched FACT. Our Vice President of Civil Rights Advocacy is an attorney and an expert in that area and a food allergy parent herself, Amelia Smith. And that's a complimentary service we offer families to guide them and assist them when they're unsure of what their rights are or what the laws are within their state. And if they do need local help or representation, we help find that for them. But usually we don't have to go that route because we're able to help them regardless. But that is a complimentary service that we offer that we are very proud of. Wonderful. Um, when the kid's a little older, I have this question. What are some safety tips for my severely food allergic teen who's heading away to college away from home? Yeah, I think sometimes that's even scarier than kids starting <laughs> kindergarten or daycare. Right. <laughs> you know, there's increasing autonomy. Um, and at that point, you know, if you're as a parent, you have less control. And, you know, uh, the teenager is, you know, grown adult at that point. Again, everywhere you go, wherever food you're eating, know the ingredients of the food, whether it's a dining hall, going out to a restaurant or party, what have you you must avoid your food allergens and have epinephrine available. I will tell you severe reactions for anaphylaxis um, tend to have worse outcomes in teenagers than they do in little kids. Um, we get nervous in little kids and babies, but babies and younger children do pretty well. Uh, teenagers tend to have some of the more severe reactions. And is it a question of different biology or the fact that there's more risk-taking behavior or not having epinephrine available? Probably a little bit of all of it. So. This is a very important, um, you know, uh, demographic to ad address. Many children, not children, many uh, in the students at college, you know, there's a lot of risk-taking behavior. There's, many will say they even try their food allergens from time to time. Um, not a good idea. So again, it's the same concepts, food avoidance, awareness around friends, of course, dining hall, dorms. Um, everyone needs to be aware. Epinephrine needs to be available. Again, if managed appropriately, these people will do very, very well, but it is an added layer and I get it, it's difficult. Um, you know, there's peer pressure, there's, you know, all that stuff, but again, food allergies have increased. So it's not as unusual to have a food allergy uh, in college or any stage of life. So really, really being honest, having a fruitful, uh, honest conversation with, you know, who you're around. Yeah. Everyone yeah, so should be on the same team taking care of each other. Yeah. And the, the screen that you have up, we have a college resource center in our education section as well, which has many sections for parents, for students. Uh, there's a section on legal considerations, dining hall services, um, behavioral health services as well, and how-to conversations for students, how to talk to your roommate about your food allergies, how to talk to your professors, dining hall staff, friends and dates, how to navigate alcohol at a party with food allergies, because we know that happens. So it's a wonderful comprehensive resource center to check out with many, many resources, including uh, resources for those who are going from high school straight into the workforce or a trade school or a community college because traditional college is not for everyone. So we include all of those areas as well. And also, I'd like to point out for kids, teens, college kids, adults with food allergies, parents and caregivers, we have a wonderful behavioral health resource center on our website for all age groups with anxiety uh, tips and resources for the different age groups, coping skills, self-care, 
how to communicate with your kids and teens, how to listen to your kids and teens when they're ready to talk to you about their mental health, um, eating disorders, disordered eating, PTSD, wealth of information. Um, and again, reviewed and approved by our medical advisory board, uh, but it's uh, just a wealth of information and resources in the Behavioral Health Resource Center too. So there's no coincidence between the fact that you have you have a child who just graduated from high school and uh, that the new college uh, toolkit is out. Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good. No, also, actually, um, there's four of us on our yeah. leadership team that all have kids going into college this fall. That's exciting. Yes, it was a wonderful team effort. <laughs> um, this is a question that we came up against a lot. I know a lot of people are waiting for this answer. Um, are the COVID vaccines safe for people with food allergies? We had someone in the chat say they were, I think, turned away from getting a vaccine. Yeah, my one word answer is not only yes, but yes, 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 yes. Um, so a history of allergic conditions, food allergies, stinging insect allergies, drug allergy, does not, we really truly believe, does not significantly increase their risk of allergic reaction to the COVID vaccine or any other side effects of the COVID vaccine. We believe this. This is what we've counseled people, certainly in our office, all of our patients, we recommend vaccination. There is a very large NIH study going on right now with tier one and 30 sites. We're actually doing the study, a group of allergic individuals and non-allergic individuals, and we're going to follow them over time to try to prove what we think we know. But certainly if you have food allergies um, or other allergic conditions, I would still encourage you to get the COVID vaccine. The benefits of vaccination are far outweigh any risks. Are there risks, or is there a risk of allergic reaction to the vaccine in general? There is, there is. It's about anywhere from one to four per million doses. Mm -hmm. Pretty low risk. Um, so I, certainly the simple answer is everyone with allergic conditions should be vaccinated, but does the benefits outweigh the risk? In fact, I, we have even vaccinated people who've had allergic reactions to dose one. We have successfully vaccinated them to dose two. Wow. At this point, I cannot think of any medical reason not to get the COVID vaccine. Certainly that's a whole other conversation for other reasons, but medical reasons, medical exemptions, I, I'm not sure I can think of a single. Um, it's an incredibly efficacious and safe vaccine, which I think is you know a big step out of this global pandemic. And I want to circle back to a, a question. It was something you've mentioned several times that I just am wondering, and I'm sure a lot of you are wondering about. You've mentioned your food allergies are on the rise. Why is that? Are we just better at diagnosing them or what's, what's creating? Yeah. Them? So no, it's actually a true increase in that incidence. And you know, they're mostly in Europe, America, and Australia. There's a big disparity between first world developed nations versus third world underdeveloped nations, or even in America between rural settings, farm settings versus urban settings, suburban settings. Interesting. So we don't know. It's very nuanced. I talked about the timing we introduction, right? Mm -hmm. Early introduction is better. A few, you know, a decade ago, we were recommending delayed introduction. Um, there's a big thing that we talk about the hygiene hypothesis, our exposures. Um, you know, overly simplistic, but, you know, we're almost too clean, which is a good thing in, you know, the U.S. and certain parts of the world, because we have less infections, right? right. We have less gastroenteritis and listeria and parasitic infections, but then, the, again, every yin has a yang, maybe we have more allergies. Um, so, you know, it's a very, very complex, nuanced discussion, a lot of research, but, you know, exposure is certainly important, hygiene hypothesis, there's all this data on varied exposures of microbiome, people who are interested in the microbiome, the bacteria that live within us, there's a trillion bacteria that live in our body, and they have a very active role in our health, um, the role of the microbiome, good bugs, bad bugs. So there's a lot of fascinating research being done of the why. All right. Well, that um, covers our Q&A portion. Um, like I said, there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to. So I do hope that we can invite you back at some point in the future to dive a little bit deeper on some of these subjects. And um, we very much appreciated all of your uh, insight and expertise today. Um, I will mention that as part of our partnership with FACT, um, we do, when you um, enroll in a new medical alert membership and you use the code FACT when you do that, we do donate 20% of the membership fee back to FACT that helps fund their work. So, you know, you're, you're protected, um, it helps FACT and it's a win-win for all of us. So if you don't have a medical alert ID, that's a great way to do it. Um, 
we talked a little bit, Eleanor. I don't know if you want to say anything else about the civil rights advocacy and helping people with accommodations. So on our website, we have a rights advocacy resource center as well with all the information on 504 plans through the ADA, um, an IHP, which is an individualized healthcare plan, an IEP. So there are different plans that might work for you, might not work for you. Usually uh, many of us with children with food allergies or other conditions such as that will have a 504 plan. And so my son has had a 504 plan throughout grade school and high school and making sure that he was accommodated in the classroom and at school and was kept safe. Um, he also has ADHD, so we also had to include that in the 504 plan as well for him through the years. But really uh, providing that assistance and guidance, you can reach out to us and we have that one-on-one -on -one direct help and assistance for you at no charge. Um, we don't ever want to charge anyone for that free immediate access to the advocacy, of course, but definitely check out the resource center. There are numerous sections in there with everything you possibly would need to know regarding accommodations in schools. We also have sample letters for schools, sample letters from allergists, sample accommodations that you can ask for within your school, depending on your child's allergens. So there's a lot of information there to, to to cipher through. Yeah, and again, we'll be including uh, these links in the follow-up email, so you'll be able to find them, but I would encourage you to spend some time um, on the FACT website. It's a tremendous and really super deep resource for um, just about any question that you can think of. Um, if you enjoyed this today, I uh, encourage you to re revisit some of our recent um, healthy hours. We've covered everything from epilepsy to malignant hyperthermia to uh, rare diseases to all sorts of topics and um, uh, and encourage you to take a look at those. We do have two events coming up. Um, we're taking August off, sorry, but uh, for September we actually have two events. Uh, Portia Singh is coming back with us to talk about staying active and preventing falls. August is fall prevention month. So um, I know that's a topic that means a lot to a lot of people. And a topic I'm excited about is about hearing health in your brain, uh, how your hearing relates to your brain function and um, how you can keep your hearing healthy. Um, I will mention this as well. This is a new product that Medical Alert has come out with recently. Um, you know, we talked about that rich um, Medical Alert health profile that you're able to keep. Um, one of the th ways that you can make it easy for you to carry that around is with this uh, Smart ID card. Um, the QR code will access your health record. You're able to pull it up on your phone. And if you have all your allergies listed there and you want to show somebody in a restaurant or share that with somebody at a camp or a school, it makes it very easy for you to access that information. And I uh, will say that um, Medic Alert is a nonprofit and uh, we've been saving and protecting lives for 65 years now. And um, your donations help us do that, fund our 24 seven emergency response service and help us put on events like these. So if you're inclined to donate, we would invite you to do so. Last but not least, we're gonna ask you, um, how helpful was this for you today? This really helps us um, understand uh, what kind of programming you enjoy and um, how we can serve you better. So um, Deanna, there you go, Deanna, thank you. Uh, we'll pop that Julie, up. I have a quick question. I know that there are some questions in the chat in the Q and A yeah. that did not get answered. Yeah. Is there a way to be able to, cause they're mostly for Dr. Mustafa. Is there a way to share them with him that he can respond? Yes. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that, sure. Oh, that'd be wonderful, oh, yeah. Sure. Thank wonderful. you. Great. Um, yeah, we can download the transcript of the chat and share that with you and uh, connect you with the folks to provide those answers. So thank you for offering to do Wonderful. that. Wonderful. Thank you. Happy to. Well, again, um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this I've learned a lot today. I enjoyed it. Um, our much gratitude to Dr. Mustafa and to Eleanor Garrow for joining us today and sharing um, so much wonderful information and so many great resources. We um, value our partnership with FACT 
and uh, thank both of you very much for your support today. Thank you so much for having us, Julie. Thank you. We appreciate your partnership as well. Thank you. Great. All right. Have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon, everyone. And uh, we'll see you back with um, some new assessments in September.